So after 22 years in business together, two brothers, one very close, uh, once very close, had a bitter falling out. It happens. They stopped speaking to each other for several years. This deeply troubled their families. So finally, on the eve of Yom Kippur, the brothers' rabbi summoned them to his office prior to Kol Nidre services. The rabbi spoke with compassion and eloquence, insisting that the brothers make up, that each give the other a second chance before the holiest day of the year. After much urging with tears and hugs, this was pre-COVID, they, they complied. Hours later, the service is over. The two brothers sort of bump into each other coming out of the synagogue. So one said, I just want to know, I just want you to know, that tonight I prayed for you what you prayed for me. With that, the brother glared at him and responded, starting up already? <laughs> so here's an interesting question. And it'll all tie together with that story. What historical events does Yom Kippur commemorate? I mean, this is our biggest holiday, our most important holiday. But for such a huge holiday, I bet you can't come up with a significant event. There's really no headliner event to latch on to. No great military victory. No miracles like a sea parting. Rosh Hashanah is tied into the creation. It doesn't get much bigger than that. It doesn't tie into the Exodus as other festivals do. But Yom Kippur, this is the, the goat of all holidays, the greatest of all time, commemorates literally the release of a goat. It's almost as if Thanksgiving commemorated the pardoning of the presidential turkey. And yet, if you include the goat thing, and I'm going to get to the goat thing a little later on, there are actually three biblical events that form the traditional historical basis for Yom Kippur. Three biblical events. All of them have something in common. All of them involve second chances. All of them involve forgiveness. So, first event. Yom Kippur commemorates the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. But hey, you say, you know, what about Shavuot, the festival that we celebrate seven weeks after Passover? What about Shavuos? Doesn't that commemorate the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai? And yes, it does. But you might recall that Moses destroyed those Ten Commandments when he saw the people dancing and cavorting at the golden calf, and without masks, no less. Then Moses convinces God to give the people another chance. And he and God collaborate on the writing of a second set. Now in life, there is nothing like the first time for anything. That's true with the Torah, too. First set of commandments were written by God, just by God, directly. People heard the first syllable, the first letter of the first Commandment directly from God. It was a vowel they didn't really hear as an aleph, but they did in some sense. Charlton Heston held up the first set of commandments. The second set, much messier. It was written by God and Moses collaboratively. It was written by committee. It's like, you know, the horse designing a camel. But that second set, as imperfect as it was, that's the one that's lasted. That's the set that was never destroyed, except maybe Raiders of the Lost Ark, but there's a question about that. The second set of commandments, that's what's commemorated on Yom Kippur. Our most sacred holiday commemorates a once-in-a-lifetime moment that happened a second time. So that's event number one. Historical event number two took place on a rooftop in Jerusalem 3,000 years ago. 
When you go to the city of David in Jerusalem, the new excavation there, it's wonderful, you can actually stand and see the view right where it happened. When you stand here, you look across the valley, the, the valley, you can see the flat roofs of Silwan on the other side, and you can see from David's palace where he looked out and saw Bathsheba bathing. And he immediately knew he had to have her, and he did. She was married, and her husband Uriah was off fighting one of David's wars. When she discovered she was pregnant, they didn't need a DNA test to know who the father was. David solved his problem, as you may recall, by having Uriah moved to the front lines, ordering the other troops to back away. Uriah was killed. David married Bathsheba, and they lived happily ever after. Ah, eh, not exactly. Because the prophet Nathan condemned the monarch and David saw the error of his ways. He was in excruciating pain. The baby then died. The house of David never knew peace. David pleaded for forgiveness, but he knew mostly misery for the rest of his days. Now you can see um, this question as to who exactly wrote the Psalms, but let's take to the traditional view that David wrote them. You look at Psalm 51. It is filled with the pathos that David could have shown. And some of that psalm was plunked right into the Yom Kippur liturgy. A direct connection is made. You'll see it in Shema Cholain. You'll see it in other prayers. This poetic masterpiece reveals the depths of the tortured king's self-recognition and despair. It is breathtaking the purity of his penitence, without even the hint of the rationalizing that we so often see. You know, none of this, I'm sorry if you were offended. None of this stuff like, you know, I'm sorry if you can't take a joke, Uriah. It is so refreshing to see this psalm, to see David's remorse. He pleads. Here's one line. Haster panecha mechatatai v'chol avonotai mechei. Don't hide your face from me, he says to God. Hide your face from my transgressions. Don't erase me. Don't wipe me out. Don't, modern term, cancel me. Blot out my iniquities. It actually, the word meche does mean to cancel. Yes, we invented cancel culture. Who knew? But in Jewish tradition, it is not the sinner who is canceled, but the sin. And forgiveness happens when there is remorse. For the sinner, there is almost always a second chance. And these stories seem to be telling us that straight out. Golden calf, charges against Israel would have included at least one count of idolatry in the second degree. And David's rap sheet, just from this one incident, is formidable. Sexual harassment, arguably rape, first degree murder of Uriah, theft since wife was property back then, adultery, of course, and for good measure, he literally coveted his neighbor's wife. He broke about half of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. Just this one incident of Bathsheba. If anyone ever deserved to be canceled, King David deserved to be canceled. But despite that, despite all that, David was forgiven. He lived a miserable family life, but he was loved by the people. His name actually, David, means beloved. His reign continues through history, his line is designated to rule forever. The Messiah is supposed to come from the line of King David. In the Bible, there are other covenants between God and uh, the people, between God and Abraham and other patriarchs and matriarchs. They're all conditional. The Ten Commandments themselves are conditional. But this was not a quid pro quo with David. 
God establishes a covenant, you see it in Samuel, that is unconditional to establish his dynasty forever. There has arguably been no more beloved figure in the 3,500 years of Jewish history than King David. It is a puzzlement. He even has a hotel named after him. And a whole lot of you are named after him too. You know, it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand how... You know, we're not trying to minimize... We're not trying to minimize the horrors of what he did. That's not Judaism. The idea is not to whitewash rape. God forbid we should never do that. We should not do that. No, no government, no state should ever do that. And we saw just yesterday the testimony of young women, the Olympic gymnasts, that certain acts deserve no mercy. So what makes David different from Larry Nassar or Harvey Weinstein? And it's a question we need to grapple with, but the answer that Yom Kippur seems to be giving us, that the Bible seems to be giving us, is genuine contrition. Soul-scorching remorse. A willingness to pay any price. And it seems like this message is so important, as sensitive as it is, that it has to be delivered as the main message of Yom Kippur. The lesson of Yom Kippur is that we need to lean just a little in the direction of second chances. That the default is on forgiveness. Because our instinct, our gut response, is typically just the opposite. We are wired for anger, revenge, and grudges. According to the Cornell Family Reconciliation Project, fully one quarter of families have members not talking to one another. In his new book, Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them, Carl Pillemer, a family sociologist at Cornell, asked participants, is there a relative with whom you have no contact? 27% said they're estranged from a family member. And half of them have been estranged for four years or more. Now, I do a lot of family events. And based on my work, I mean, hardly a funeral goes by without some kind of family drama taking place, because that's the time when people see each other unplanned after not having seen each other for a long time in some cases. I think it's a low estimate, 27%. I think a lot of people, you know, how they respond to pollsters in different ways. I think this is one where I would be embarrassed to tell a pollster that I'm not on speaking terms with a close relative. By the way, I feel fortunate at this moment. I'm on speaking terms with all of my living relatives and most of my dead ones. <laughs> I can proudly visit our cemetery and know that I'm talking to all of them. At times when they were alive, we had our things. But it's not easy. As Pillamer states, the phenomenon of cutting off or being, cutting off, being cut off from a family member is strikingly common in America. And not just America. Do you know what was the highest non-sports TV rated event of the past year? You guessed it. Oprah's interview with Harry and Meghan. Did you watch it? Let's show of hands. Okay, all of you at home? hands? Did you enjoy it? No hands are up. <laughs> okay. I can say that a lot of people did enjoy it. There's a little bit of schadenfreude. There's also a little bit of a sense that dysfunctional families know no national class or ethnic boundaries. It's something we all share. And that's a little comforting. It's not, not a shameful thing to know that the rich and famous deal with the same things that the rest of us do. 
It's important, again, I can't emphasize it enough, that Judaism does not stress turning the other cheek. I'm not sure I could have forgiven David or the Israelites at the golden calf, but the fact that God did is a signal to us that the, before we declare someone unredeemable, we need to pause for just a second to let our better angels come forward. It's hard. Writing in Slate recently about the, the hit TV series Ted Lasso, I mentioned the show last night, it's a great show. Rare show about a genuinely nice guy. So Anna Nordberg states, too often compassion is associated with weakness when in fact it's the opposite. It takes nothing to put someone down in order to solve whatever emptiness is inside you. It takes nothing to go for the kill instead of trying to help others. But it does take courage, true radical courage, to make the choice to be a good person every day. In that show, the title character is betrayed, spoiler alert, by people he trusts. It turns out he was set up to fail. But he turns to the perpetrator of the ruse who betrayed him and says simply, I forgive you. That is true, radical courage. And it shocks us because it seems so counterintuitive. It is so hard to be forgiving. That's the message here. Not that a power-driven murderer king deserves clemency. There are some things that are beyond the pale, but very little is beyond the pale of love if the plea for forgiveness is genuine. Sometimes forgiveness doesn't need to take the form of a dramatic apology. Sometimes it comes in with soft, cat-like footsteps. Suddenly the person is just there, bearing a smile that says it's okay. And what was it that we were arguing about anyway? Research on the health benefits of forgiveness shows that people who can make the mental shift benefit in ways that they didn't anticipate, namely by living longer. But I didn't need psychology today to tell me that. It's in the Ten Commandments. One of the few commandments in the entire a Torah to state a rationale next to the mitzvah is the commandment to honor our parents. And why? Laman yarichun yamecha Honor your parents so that you may live long. Psalm 51, that psalm where David pleads for forgiveness, pleads for forgiveness, includes a verse that we read every single day in the Amidah. It's read silently at the beginning, in the introduction. Adonai, Svatai, Tiftach, Ufi Yagiti Hilatecha. O Lord, open my lips and let my mouth declare your praise. It's also found in the Yom Kippur liturgy. So the great medieval commentator Rashi says, O Lord, you shall open my lips, which is weird. God's going to open your mouth so you can talk to praise God. It's sort of like a circular logic. So Rashi says what he's really saying is, David is saying is, forgive me, God, so that unburdened by the guilt of my sin, I can declare your praise with purity, with completeness. I can approach the whole world with a, an attitude of praise and healing, which will heal me as I attempt to heal others. I can give back. David is begging to be uncanceled, and he was redeemed. And he rose from the depths of sin with a literary flourish never again equaled, 150 times over. Not even Shakespeare compiled such a legacy. Psalm after psalm, David's words rose from the depths of his self-inflicted wounds. We can feel their pathos. That is why we so adore those who make the most of their second chances. Next time you begin the Amida with that one silent line, try to imagine the feelings of that tormented king and let it lead us to taking more responsibility for our actions and to put a default on forgiveness. Even from the point of view of Kabbalists, Jewish mystics, the default on forgiveness is built into the very nature of the universe. 
There are cosmic forces, emanations of God, that establish a balance. And the two key divine qualities that balance each other out in the cosmos are chesed, mercy and love, and gevura, justice. And they are completely in balance. But chesed, love, is on the right-hand side, which is typically the stronger side, except for we lefties. So that's where the default lies. It's on the right side. Love wins by a hair. Our sources take this default on forgiveness very seriously. But alas, in our society, the default is not on forgiveness, but on outrage. We shoot first and ask questions later. We've been coarsened by an outrage industry whose goal is to get people so angry that they will willingly part with their money and in some cases their sanity. How refreshing it is. I know people don't always love to be asked for money, but to have a fundraiser as we do here, which focuses only on positive things. We didn't have to say we're going to, you know, go under We're in deep water. We we talked about the good things that we do. We're not trying to stoke anger. And that is the outrage industry in our country and in our world. The goal should always be to create a community of mutual dependence and trust where all that matters is the fostering of human dignity and seeing our fellow human being as created in God's image. We've got to stop canceling and start listening. We've got to stop accusing and start forgiving. Our greatest leaders were significantly flawed. King David and Moses and Miriam. All could easily have been utterly canceled. But they all got second chances. Now we're all capable of becoming cancellation machines. And that's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm afraid that we're tending toward if we're not careful. I mean, there are a lot of things I'd love to cancel. Sponge cake. (laughs) Especially dry sponge cake. You know, who wants to eat a cake that tastes like a sponge? I would love to cancel that Cars for Kids song. I mean, the charity is worthwhile. It's just the song. It has to go. And I still can't remember the phone number. I would love to cancel robocalls, except carols. Can we all agree that they should be banned? And I know there's been efforts to do that. I mean, I'd love to cancel 3 a.m. If you wake up and it's 3 a.m., there's nowhere to go. You just have to wait it out. I wish they could go straight from 2.59 to, say, 5. And I know it's a sign of leadership, the old commercial, you know, to answer those 3 a.m. phone calls. And I've gotten some of those serious ones, but mostly they're robocalls from cars to kids, for kids. (laughs) There is time when outrage is justified. Again, I have to say that I once called for Bernie Madoff to be excommunicated. And excommunication is, is not a tool lightly used. When it is used, however, it's most often abused. But more often, what's called for is not outright cancellation, but mid-course reassessment as more information comes in, which needs to be accompanied by a whole heap of humility and a recognition that like David, Moses, and Miriam, even our beloved country is not perfect. David French, the conservative thinker, argued in an essay for time that the love for country we instill in our children shouldn't rest on American innocence or greatness. Rather, we should love our country the way we love our family, which means telling the full story, the good, the bad, the ugly. We shouldn't leave anything out. We can judge and we can learn lessons, but ultimately we can still love our country unconditionally, just as God loved David. The model is there neither to forgive nor forget what can't be forgiven, but to love nonetheless. Now, I have no intent on getting into the weeds too much on cancel culture, and there's a lot to discuss 
very important stuff in academia, in politics, in the media, etc. But, and also I don't want to belittle in any way the impact of, of triggers on victims who have suffered. I would never suggest that one who is abused forgive the abuser. All I'm suggesting here is that Yom Kippur calls upon us to take extraordinary steps to listen with a focus not on the sinner, but the sin. Always remember that when we repent on Yom Kippur, it is in the plural. We all take responsibility for what transpires in the world around us. So at the outset, I mentioned that there are three biblical events that account for Yom Kippur's origins. First was Ten Commandments, take two. And the second, King David's trifecta of theft, theft rape, and murder. Now the third origin story is even stranger than the first two. It involves another second chance, this time for a goat. And we, we heard it in our Torah reading today, which is so beautifully read by our, our teens and adults who read Torah. Leviticus speaks of two goats in the Yom Kippur ritual. One was sacrificed. Not crazy about sacrifices, don't want them restored, but that was the way they did it back then. But what about the second one? That's the unusual one. The high priest, and we read it in the reading, would lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the transgressions of the Israelites, and the goat would then carry these sins to an inaccessible region, and then, quote, be set free in the wilderness. Now the Mishnah indicates it was eventually led off a cliff in a ravine outside Jerusalem. There are a lot of them out there in the Judean wilderness. But that's not in the Torah. So let's take the Torah at its word. The Torah says the goat was freed. The goat, burdened with an entire nation's sins, was let go. Perhaps the Torah is trying to teach us that the key to our forgiveness is that goat walks on four legs because there's something about animals and second chances. I realize this, I know I talk about my dogs occasionally, but I was playing with Casey, the big one, <laughs> and I hit him inadvertently with a tennis ball. And he looked at me for a second, and it was as if he was asking me, what have I done wrong? I felt so horribly. He forgave, as dogs always do. One Atlanta rabbi wrote that his dog, Jack, is a paragon of forgiveness. I've locked him in the basement accidentally, kicked him in the dark accidentally, left him outdoors on the deck in the chill of winter accidentally. But never is he vindictive, nasty, or cold. He doesn't pout nor storm away into another room. He is quick to forgive. And then he adds, dogs can help us prepare for Yom Kippur. Though occasionally wronged, they quickly move on with a lick and a wagging tail. Okay, this guy needs to be reported. But the message is important. Jennifer Skiff, who wrote The Divinity of Dogs, wrote, Dogs, for a reason that can only be described as divine, have the ability to forgive, let go of the past, and live each day joyously. It says it's, it's something for the rest of us to strive for. We see this in our sources too. Proverbs 12, whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast. Pope Francis got aboard this gravy train in 2014 when a distraught little boy whose dog has died, kid died came up to him and he said, paradise is open to all of God's creatures. Now whether or not animals have souls, and I do believe they do, they're certainly good for our souls. And that includes this scapegoat. Goat number two bears the burden of all our transgressions because only an animal can. And our ancestors watched that goat walking out over the horizon. They knew in their hearts that all creatures deserve a second chance. That goat who 50-50 chance could have been sacrificed got to walk away. And they understood that powerful moment that even they were in the position of that goat 
What a powerful moment it must have been to know that just by the luck of the draw, they could also have a second chance. So when we place our sins onto the scapegoat, it's because the animal is so pure it can bear that burden. We highlight the innocence of the creature so we can emulate it. In Jewish tradition, only a pure being can achieve that level of chesed, of innocent kindness. Only a creature like that goat can be the goat of second chances. For the high priest who gave the goat her freedom, the default was on forgiveness. For the whale who gave Jonah a second chance, the default was on forgiveness. For God who gave David and the Israelites at the golden calf a second chance, the default was on forgiveness. And when we line up all of these Yom Kippur origin stories, the second Ten Commandments, David's trifecta, and that wandering goat, the lesson of second chances is itself given a second reading and then a third. It drives the message home through repetition again and again and again. Three times we are reminded the default is on forgiveness. It's a reminder that we desperately need because we are inflexible. We are intolerant. We are dogmatic. We are schadenfreude addicts. We are insecure. We are knee-jerk responders. We are hypercritical. We are purveyors of malicious gossip. And we are so darned judgmental. But we're also capable of breathtaking kindness. We just need a little reminder or two or three. Martin Luther King Jr. proclaimed famously that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. For Jews, the moral universe's arc must bend at least as much toward forgiveness, kindness, and love. May we all find the peace of mind that only a true teshuva can provide, an unconditional forgiveness, and a world reborn in God's image where sins can be canceled and kindness always prevails. Amen.